So today we're going to talk a little bit more about metabolic health, specifically focusing on viral load. We're hearing so much in the media about how it's our moral obligation to do certain things because we can then reduce the probability of transmitting pathogens and have lower viral load. And I want to share with you just cur I curated all of the recent studies that I could find correlating poor metabolic health, dysglycemia, also known as insulin resistance or volatile blood sugar, and having obesity and how that is correlated with increased viral load and prolonged shedding of pathogens. Again, because we're hearing in the media from all these people, uh, what is it, Kyrie Irving, there's uh, basketball players, there's different, you know, the, the, the co-chair for Washington State uh, University, WS, WSU football team is being ostracized for different choices that he made. Uh, and so we're, there's a lot of like pressure from individuals and this moral sort of obligation, you know, it's the moral thing to do to protect other people to, to do these certain things. But I would like to present to you that the argument based upon science, remember, Following the science is what a lot of people are claiming ostensibly to do. So we're going to follow the science and talk about how eating donuts, eating cupcakes, eating, going to the fast food restaurant for dinner, not exercising, watching Netflix until two in the morning, having your phone in your bedroom, not managing your stress, how that actually leads to dysglycemia, increased levels of inflammation, and, and increased abdominal visceral adiposity that are all correlated with a higher probability of higher viral load and more severe infection. So this is our moral obligation to become metabolically healthy so that when your parents, your friends, your family, your in-laws uh, around the Thanksgiving table, around Christmas holidays, you know, they're going to give you crap for making different decisions. And you need to say and stand up and say, look, I choose to be healthy. It's my moral obligation to not be another cog in the healthcare system, to not have the obesity, the hypertension, the type 2 diabetes. Those are the individuals that are clogging up the healthcare system. With all due respect, and I know a lot of you are working on your health right now, so I'm not trying to you know, undermine your progress or victim blame. I'm just saying it's, it's all, all of our obligation, right? to become metabolically healthy, to have better blood sugar regulation, to have lower body fat, because all of these different clinical situations are linked with reduced viral load, and the data is overwhelming. In fact, when I share these studies with you, you're going to be like, why haven't I seen this yet on CNN or MSNBC? Why isn't NPR talking about these studies? Because they have very important public health implications. So we're going to dive into that. We're also going to talk about... Um, you know, the importance of probiotics and actually gut health. There's some interesting data on gut health in this gut-lung axis and how if you have intestinal permeability or dysbiosis in the gut, it might affect your lungs and the permeability in your lungs. Some interesting new studies that I want to share with you about that. And let's start off with this paper here. This was in the British uh, Journal of Medicine. It was an editorial piece. The title of the paper is Obesity and COVID-19, The Role of the Food Industry. Now, why is this paper important? Because these authors go on to talk about there's a lot of correlations here with obesity and fast food consumptions. And we now know that, you know, during the COVID-19 pandemic, there was an increase in food poverty, there was food shortages, and there's more food shortages coming. We're going to talk about that in a moment. But disruptions in supply chains and panic buying caused people to have limited access to fresh, real food. So what did they turn to? They turned to chips, they turned to flour, they turned to cookies and bread, pasta, sugar. I remember sugar was sold out, flour was sold out. So people were impulse buying. And then there was all these thinly veiled advertising campaigns by the food industry. Remember, we're going to support healthcare workers. I remember Chick-fil-A uh, in Portland, Oregon was delivering uh, fried chicken sandwiches to hospital workers. And we all we all know the story of Krispy Kreme's donuts, don't we? Uh, so, so there's been all these incentives for various interventions and they're all from the food industry, but there's no outrage. There's outrage for people who don't wear a mask. Oh, there's outrage, you know, if you're on the airplane and you happen to have your mask below your nose, uh, people will get really irritated with you. Like, what are you doing as they're crushing Cheez-Its and drinking soda? They're going to be mad at you for the mask being below your nose while they willingly weaken their immune system and increase the probability that if they get exposed, they're going to have a more severe disease. Like, it is insane, Right. But yet you have scientists who are pointing this out. Hey, where's the outrage? Where is the medical community and the media and the politicians like talking about the role that the food industry has had in worsening this virus that should be relatively benign for most people if they didn't have the underlying health conditions, the hypertension, the diabetes, the overweightness that is a direct result of consuming the food that the food industry sells, which, by the way, our government subsidizes. So, you know, those hostess cakes and the all of the Oreos and all this processed food that costs like 99 cents. 
Whereas an apple or an avocado or a bag of nuts are very expensive. You're like, well, how is this happening? Because the government is subsidizing these ultra processed, you know, uh, mono crops, the soy, the corn, the wheat, um, and canola and so forth. So interesting paper here. I think people, if they care about saving lives, should be really upset with the food industry, should be really upset with the politicians who have repeatedly voted yes on the farm bill since 2003. One of those politicians is actually leading this country right now. So people should be upset. Now, why are we putting this out? Because we are now seeing again, empty shelves, you know, supply chain shortages and all this. And I don't want us to miss this critical window to favorably change our habits. So they're talking about how there might not be turkeys for Thanksgiving now, because there's a shortage in the, the labor for processing these turkeys uh, after the fact. So guess what? Go to craigslist.com. I reserve my turkey today, not from Safeway, from a local farmer who happened to have heritage turkeys that are out there, uh, just eating bugs and things like that, What tur eating what turkeys should be eating, okay? You can start growing your own chickens because these, these labor shortages, I don't know if they're gonna resolve themselves anytime soon, especially if there's a winter surge and all of this sort of stuff, which uh, I, I actually predict that there will be, I don't think it will be as bad uh, you know, as maybe last winter because there is more immunity, but I do believe that there will, we're going to see more and more cases and, and, and all of this. So um, I don't want us to miss this window of opportunity. We shouldn't be relying upon importing food from other countries to serve the citizens of our own country when we have very fertile land here. So please, friends, go to farmer's markets, call a local rancher, farmer, try to buy more locally so that when there is, you know, empty shelves, you don't care. You're like, as long as I have basic necessities, you can make your own soap if need be, right? We can all become a little bit more resourceful. So go to Craigslist, reserve your turkey. It's easy to do to process a turkey. I've done videos on this. Um, you know, I can link them if you'd like. A lot of people didn't like those videos. They want to buy the meat and be so divorced from the process, which I think is part of the problem it leads to waste and uh, you know overconsumption. So we need to be more involved. This is what people did. Um, you can do this with your friends and family. Okay, really fascinating paper. We're going to dive into this. The title: of This is elevated glucose levels favor SARS-CoV-2 infection and monocyte response through a complex mechanism known as this hypoxia inducible factor one alpha via glycol glycolysis dependent axis. So. There's a lot of jargon in this title uh, of the article here in Cell Metabolism. But to make a long story short, um, the scientists found that the data suggests that, and they used um, monocytes from real humans, some were overweight and diabetic, and some were not. And they found that individuals with high circulating levels of glucose may be more susceptible to infection, infection SARS-CoV-2 infections, and have viral load. So they were able to test this hypothesis by infecting cultured monocytes from isolated obese diabetic patients, uh, and compared those to healthy controls, and they found that the viral load was dramatically increased. You can see here, it's statistically significantly increased in the individuals who were overweight and had diabetes. So altogether, these data suggest that, these data indicate that elevated glucose levels directly promote viral replication and cytokine expression. So we've known now about this immunometabolism, how our metabolism, you know, how we, we curate and, and redistribute energy in our body, is intimately involved in our body's immune response and aberrant metabolic responses, hyperglycemia, glycemic variability. We've talked about the at-home hemoglobin A1C test by biocoach.io, phenomenal test to see where you are at in terms of your glucose regulation over the long haul, right? We know that there can be ebbs and flows in our fasting glucose, but yeah, our hemoglobin A1C reflects our baseline or our average glucose level. So I will link that below. You can save using code HH10 over at biocoach.io. Okay, we have a lot of uh, stuff here to, to continue to talk about. Uh, we're not gonna really dive further into diabetes, although I will share a few references at the end just so that you have them. They're in the notes here, they're in the video. Um, but this correlation with obesity, as we sort of transition gears here to the role that obesity has in terms of having increased levels of viral load, this is not known, this is not new. It's been long known, even in influenza outbreaks and so forth, that overweight individuals have prolonged viral shedding. They have changes in their breath, more virus in the breath, and more viral variability. And it might be, I think, you know, this is really why I want to share this podcast, that we should be promoting metabolic health if we're concerned about new variants emerging. Because if you think about more viral load means more viral replication. 
So we're hearing so much about, well, the vaccinated versus the unvaccinated. The unvaccinated are, are super spreaders. They're causing the prolongation of this pandemic. But you're like, well, if you're overweight or you're obese uh, and you're, you have high viral load, even though you are immunized, there's still a lot of virus replicating. And just over time, through random chance, a mutation occurs if it's selectively advantageous and that virus would then have increased transmissibility and so forth. So I, I think there could be something here with regards to overweight metabolic dysfunction and the emergence of new highly transmissible variants. And we're going to get to a, an article here that, that actually talks about that. And that is yet another reason that we should all have a moral obligation to eat more real food, to exercise, to manage our stress, to focus on sleep and circadian rhythms. So I think that's really, really important. So this is not new. I've, I've shared a lot. Of, this is a great image here uh, from Ryan et al. And so it, they talk about how body fat is a reservoir for coronaviruses. Uh, and it's linked with prolonged viral shedding because of these receptors. So we're going to get into all that. But first, friends, I want to welcome you all back. It's Mike Mutzel. I'm grateful that you're tuning into High Intensity Health Radio. Hopefully, you're enjoying this video. If you are, you can hit that like button. Leave us a comment below. That tells YouTube that people like you might like this video as well. That goes a long way. Also, the number one thing that you can do to help this video and this podcast platform, whether you're listening in iTunes, whether you're watching on YouTube, is to take this URL and share this URL directly. Send a text to your friends and family. Say, hey, I think you might want to watch this video. I think you f might like to see some of these scientific studies that you may not have seen on your you know, network news, things like that. That goes a long way. Now, we have a great new electrolyte pr product coming out that features red mineral salt, an array of bioavailable minerals like potassium, calcium. You have the sodium, of course, uh, and then also taurine and creatine. So this is a multi-ingredient electrolyte combination featuring red mineral salt, not this USP salt imported from China, right? We're trying to get... A domestic ingredients. So all the minerals, by the way, friends, are derived from Utah, from Albion in Ogden, Utah. And then we also have, of course, Redmond Real Salt, which is down south of Provo. So you can support your body's healthy hydration and also optimize athletic performance by going over to myoscience.com. That's M-Y-O-X-C-I-E-N-C-E.com, myoscience with an X.com. When you buy one electrolyte sticks, you get the second box 100% discounted. So that's buy one, get one free. So you have to add two to the shopping cart, and the second one will be discounted 100%. That only goes through the end of the month. That's the end of October. So take advantage of that pre-sale. This formula is coming. It's a great formula. It tastes phenomenal. It mixes so easily. I know you're going to dig it. So uh, definitely check that out. I will put links below for that as well. So let's get into um, this paper right here. Uh, the title here, and we we shared some details of this a few weeks ago, but there was an, a recent editorial from a scientist, Jonathan Brestoff. And so Jonathan Brestoff is an MD, PhD, and he also has a master's degree in public health. He's over at Washington University School of Medicine. So he wrote an editorial on this paper, and the title of this is Clinical Immunological and Virological SARS-CoV-2 Phenotypes in Obese and Non-Obese Military Health System Beneficiaries. So the long and short of this study is what they found is in outpatients who had contracted the virus, there was a, an increased viral load in the individuals that had higher levels of body mass index. Now, we know that BMI is a very crude sort of height for weight measurement. It doesn't account for lean body mass and, and differentiate unhealthy fat from healthy tissue. However, they did show a very statistically significant, significant correlation and increase with BMI and viral load. So this is important. It's our moral obligation to get healthy, friends, because we don't want to have high viral load. Now, if I can just share a small anecdote before we actually get into what uh, Dr. Brestoff uh, talked about. When I unknowingly was exposed to SARS-CoV-2, um, the first few days, I was around other people. I was. And, and some of these people have comorbidities. I did not get them sick. Once I started to feel symptomatic, I, of course, distanced myself. I wore a mask around team members, employees, things like that got no one sick, okay? And the virus, I had like, it was like a day and a half, okay? And then after that, of course, I was around other people and no one got sick. So I happened to get exposed to this, this pathogen that is circulating that has caused a lot of people to change how they interact with the world and manage to not get anyone else ill. Uh, how is that even possible? Well, turns out that healthier people, metabolically healthier people have lower viral load, a shorter shedding period, and have a, a greater probability of a mild course of infection. So there is, again, for the 10th time, it's your moral obligation to improve your health because you want to, you don't want to be the one responsible for getting other people sick, do you? No, I know you don't. So this is why we need to you know, exercise. Go for a 10-minute walk after you eat. 
uh, ride your bike or walk to, to work or school. Uh, that, that's uh, really important. Okay, so Jonathan Brestoff goes on to say, you know, uh, he's making some observations from this really interesting study that I was just alluding to you uh, about the the military recruits. And, and, uh, I, I'm sorry, it was like 600 active military members. We shared the details of, of that study with you early September. So he goes on to say, do these differences in viral load and antibody production reproduce in other populations? For example, in Hispanic people and African-American people, et cetera. If so, this might suggest that the host pathogen interactions are altered in obese patients exposed to SARS-CoV-2. We've known this for quite a while. We've been talking about this. Second, does higher viral load in obese outpatients have any implications for transmissibility of the virus? Meaning higher viral load because you're overweight and it could be that you know fat tissues we, we've sort of been talking about is a reservoir for a virus and so forth. If the viral load differences found in the study are also seen for emerging variants with higher transmission rates such as Delta, the effect could be multiplicative. And we've seen that in the South, right? We know that Arkansas, Louisiana, Alabama, uh, you know, St. Louis, you know, outside of Missouri. These were, were states and regions of the country that were disproportionately, at least over the summer, hit hard. Now, we know that obesity rates happen to be very high in those, um, in those states as well. So of note, the analysis conducted by Epsi et al. was performed before the Delta variant was documented, so that's kind of interesting. Thirdly, do higher anti-spike protein antibody uh, concentrations result in better or lasting SARS-CoV-2 immunity in obese individuals. So it was interesting because of the higher viral load, at least initially there were higher antibody responses right out of the gate. So there's a lot of questions here and I think this is interesting. I would encourage you, I, I just took like two paragraphs from the article. It's free, it's easy to find. I'll put it in the show notes. I think that's worth reading. Now, before we go on, I just wanna make sure that we're all on the same page. This was a very early study that was referenced highly, I think 700 references on this. The title of this is Detectable Serum SARS-CoV-2 Viral Load is Closely Associated with Drastically Elevated Interleukin-6 Level in Critically Ill COVID-19 Patients. So there is a correlation between the levels of the innate immune system byproduct known as interleukin-6. It's a cytokine. It's an interleukin. It's a chemical messenger that your immune system uses uh, to respond to immunologic triggers, such as a viral infection. Well, it turns out Obese individuals, individuals that have diabetes, chronic smoldering, low-grade background inflammation, like higher levels of C-reactive protein, they have higher levels of interleukin-6. So if your interleukin-6 is already elevated and then you throw in a viral infection, influenza, whatever, guess what? You know, you're going to potentially have more collateral damage with a so-called cytokine swarm. So it's important, again, it's our moral obligation to walk, to eat real food, to eat less processed junk food, because this has been known, it's a, it's a great proxy for viral load. So again, if you have high levels of baseline interleukin-6, and you can, you can measure IL-6, um, measuring cytokines does get expensive, so I, I frequently measure or have my clients measure C-ratchet protein, because it's, it, it, if that is elevated, it, it's highly probable that TNF-alpha and interleukin-6 and interleukin-1-beta and interferon-gamma, like all these other cytokines, will probably be elevated as well, meaning that you have some low-grade smoldering inflammation. It usually is a result of under-exercising and over-consumption of packaged food, like it can be more complicated with other, you know, co-infections, Lyme and Borrelia and mold and this. But generally speaking, that is going to take care of a lot of that background inflammation. Moving more, eating less junk food, okay? So that's been known for a long time. Now, the, let's get into this study. This was, there's two, two more studies we got to dive into. They're just fascinating here. The title of this one is Association Between Upper Respiratory Tract Viral Load, Comorbidities, Disease Severity, and Outcomes in Patients with SARS-CoV-2 Infections. So this was in the Journal of Infectious Diseases. This is not the Journal of Conspiracy Theories Research. As you see and look at this table here, um, this is the um, Upper Respiratory Tract Viral Load Levels in 487 Patients. As you can see in this table, there's a correlation here between comorbidities and levels of viral load. And they show the p-value here of 0.002. So there is a strong correlation with higher viral load linked with these different common comorbid conditions, again, that are caused by our own diet and lifestyle choices. So the authors go on to say, we studied the upper respiratory tract viral load in 1,122 patients with SARS-CoV-2 infection diagnosed during the first epidemic wave in Greece. To the best of our knowledge, this is one of the largest studies looking at SARS-CoV-2 upper respiratory tract viral load published so far to date to explore in clinical practice. Uh, both asymptomatic versus symptomatic patients and their comorbid conditions. The number of cases allowed us to investigate the association with viral load and specific comorbidities. 
So these common comorbidities that are that were linked with higher viral load. Look at obesity. So this one here, you have, you know, twelve patients uh, had. Uh, super high, you know, viral load compared to just three patients with obesity that had low viral load. Uh, the same here, the significance for hypertension. So, uh, 25 patients that were that they looked at had low viral load versus 37 patients uh, had high viral load, and so the p value is 0.002. So, again, this is interesting for the people, the friends, your family, your coworkers, everyone, your employers, like. Dude, come on, you gotta be like everyone else. You can say, well, look, I, I'm I'm working on my health here. The probability of me not having super high levels of, of virus uh, it could be quite low, uh, especially if you're metabolically healthy, if you exercise, if you take care of yourself. So again, it's our moral obligation to be healthy. This study I thought was interesting. So exhaled aerosol increases with COVID-19 infection, age, and obesity. This found a linear correlation between BMI years. So they did this mathematical correlation. I don't know why they did this, maybe so they could make the data more clean visually, but they multiplied body mass index by the year. And what they found is that there was a significant correlation between increasing BMI years. So again, age matters too, right, with viral load. Uh, and that makes sense, you know, the older you are, the weaker your innate immune system might be. Um, your, your T cells might be a little bit, there might be more smoldering background, chronic inflammation. So there could be higher viral load. So it makes sense. So uh, our findings indicate that the capacity of the airway lining mucus to resist breaking up uh, on breathing very significantly between individuals with a trend to increasing with the advance of COVID-19 infection and body mass index multiplied by age. Okay, understanding the source and variance of respiratory droplet generation and controlling it via the stabilization of airway lining mucus surfaces may lead to effective approaches to reducing COVID-19 uh, infection and transmission. So, you know, figuring out, well, how can we lower BMI? We could lower BMI by encouraging people to walk, encouraging people to make their food from scratch, buy their food uh, from a local farmer, try to, try to make a practice or a goal this, this next year to, to buy food that was grown within a hundred mile radius of your home. Like it can be challenging, but it can be done. So um, check that out. So here is the graph here. And they looked at, you know, spreader versus super spreader. There's a lot of scientific nuances, you know, that we're going to, we're just really simplifying this here. But as you can see, there is a linear increase. There's a trend. The R value, the R squared was 0.98. So it's, you know, this is a, a correlation here, strong correlation. It doesn't tell you the direction of causality. But there is much higher viral load uh, found in increasing BMI and increasing age uh, compared to younger individuals. So um, you can see here the the low spreaders mostly are younger individuals and lower BMI. Uh, they they have uh, fairly low levels of virus exhaled from their um, from their mouths. So important stuff here. It's not really talked about in the media. Again, this might be deemed as fat shaming. This might be deemed as victim blaming and all that. But I like to. To share with you the science, I think this study is, is quite interesting. So let's get into a little bit more about the gut, about gut health. Um, you know, I'm a huge fan of eating whole real foods. We know that that diverse array of, of real foods actually support microbiome diversity. We know exercise actually supports gut health. We know that not over-consuming alcohol, that managing our stress, getting a good night's sleep, all these things can actually improve the integrity of the vessels uh, and also the epithelial tissue in, in the gut. And that might also affect uh, the lungs. There's this gut-lung axis. So the title of this paper is Obesity and Diabetes as Comorbidities for COVID-19, Underlying Mechanisms and the Role of Viral Bacterial Interactions. So you can see here, uh, and there's the non-obese, non-diabetic lung. And then there's the obese, type 2 diabetic lung. And you can see here, there's a co-infection. There's a virus and a bacteria together. The virus is hijacking on uh, this, this bacterium. So We've seen this co-infection thing go on where some people might get COVID, but then they get a bacterial lung in infection, pneumonia, that could be underlying dysbiosis. So various studies have actually shown that if you have dysbiosis, you're more likely to have severe outcomes with COVID. Now, you might say, well, what is dysbiosis? Dysbiosis is imbalanced in your gut bacteria. Now, you, this could happen for reasons that you have no control over. For example, how you were born. You know, maybe your parents decided to have a C-section delivered birthing process. Maybe your mom didn't breastfeed you, so you had infant formula. Maybe you were given antibiotics because persistent ear infections. You know, maybe you've been given proton pump inhibitors because you've acid reflux. So, you, you know, there's a lot of things that can compromise and alter the integrity of our gut and, and the levels and the, the composition of those bacteria. But there's a lot of things we can do to improve that. 
You can take probiotics. You can take Saccharomyces boulardii, the probiotic yeast. You can eat whole real foods. You can have more olives. You can have more fermented foods. You can make your food from scratch. Processed food, especially having something like French fries, pizza, uh, cheeseburgers with bacon and bread and all that. Uh, highly processed carbs with fat together is a bomb to uh, you know not only cause dysbiosis, but compromise the integrity of your intestinal epithelial tissue, which can then potentially lead to um, you know, the, these sort of co-infections and alter the gut lung axis. So here we go. The synergistic viral bacterial interactions and the severity of COVID-19. It is already well established that the microbiota can directly or indirectly impact the outcome and differential viral infection. Uh, viruses bind to bacteria through lipopolysaccharide. We've talked a lot about this, especially in my book, Belly Fat Effect. So check that out. Or peptidoglycan. Uh, and this binding can provide an enhanced attachment of the virus to its receptor on the surface of host cells, thereby enhancing in its infectivity. So the idea that the virus can sort of hijack its way into the body like a Trojan horse onto bacterial, gram-negative bacterial lipopolysaccharide, which you all have. We all have five grams plus or minus of LPS. LPS, lipopolysaccharide, is just this appendage on gram-negative bacteria. It really shouldn't be getting into your body in systemic circulation. But again, if you're eating milkshakes, Pop-Tarts, cookies, processed foods, uh, Cheez-Its, you know, chicken nuggets, French fries, then guess what happens? You alter the balance of, of bugs in your gut. You compromise that single cell lining called the intestinal epithelial tissue, also known as leaky gut. And the viral bacterial sort of Trojan horse interaction that we were talking about can cause the absorption of pathogens, whether it's SARS-CoV-2 or other pathogens, and, and that binding can effectively increase uh, the viral load in the lungs, as this paper just said. So on the other hand, respiratory viruses can promote bacterial pneumonia, thereby altering the microbiome in the upper airway tract and promoting bacterial accumula accumulation in the lower uh, airway tract. So just really, I think this stuff is super fascinating. Um, so here is just more text here. Uh, whereas the gut lung access is established as an important determinant of severity in uh, pulmonary diseases, the role of metabolic endotoxemia and severity of COVID-19 remains poorly investigated. Nevertheless, several groups have reported significant changes in gut microbiome and in LPS levels in patients with severe forms of COVID-19. ACE2 receptors that we've talked about on the surface of fat cells and so forth have a major impact on the composition of the microbiome. So again, you're like, wow, so hypertensive people might have dysregulated microbiomes because of this ACE2 receptor. It's fascinating stuff. This paper, by the way, has wonderful images. I'll link it in the show notes. So ACE2 receptor modulation by viral infection can significantly influence the content and leakage from the gut. This is top down and bottom up. It goes both ways. So if you get infected, you might and it, you know, cause more leakage from your intestine. And if you have dysbiotic bacteria in your intestine, that can then leak through and cause more inflammation. This is insane. Okay, um, so they want to say ACE2 receptor modulation by viral infection can significantly, we talked about that, uh, in the gut. Indeed, severe forms of COVID-19 were connected with pronounced gastrointestinal symptoms. Post-mortem analysis of 20 individuals who succumbed to this virus demonstrated uh, that enterobacteria, enterobacteriaceae uh, were more abundant in the human gut and can release large amount of endotoxin. They were very common uh, also in the lung tissue. A cross-sectional analysis of 30 patients with COVID-19, 24 patients with influenza A, and 30 matched healthy controls revealed significantly higher abundance of opportunistic pathogens in the gut microbiota of COVID-19 patients. So what's the chicken or what's the egg? I think you got to focus on both, right? But eating real food, uh, maybe eating more fermented foods, compressing your feeding window, exercise, these are all things that are great for gut health. In a small perspective study on 19 patients with severe pulmonary forms of COVID-19, bacterial DNA and toxins were found in blood samples of almost all individuals, whereas over 40% of them had high and over 89% had increased endotoxin levels measured with uh, a, a very uh, chemiluminescence-based endotoxin activity assay. Okay, remember, so in these individuals, there was high levels of bacterial DNA in the blood of individuals who had uh, severe COVID. So was it the chicken or the egg? You know, well, they talk about this gut-lung axis. So if you have poor gut health, then you might have a weakened immunity or immune response uh, in your lungs. So we got to focus on health, friends. I don't know how many other times I can say it. 
Uh, really important stuff. So the final image here that we're going to share and the final, this is from a paper titled The Relevance of Physical Activity uh, on and Physical Fitness on Immune Defense Mitigating Disease Burden with a Focus on COVID-19 Consequences. The, the differences between being sedentary and being physically active. So sedentary people have reduced muscle function, increased cardiovascular risk factors, uh, impaired immune function, immunosenescence, and increased incidence of lung inflammation and bacterial pneumonia. Uh, they also have uh, increased body fat and all this. So that leads to, as you can see in this image, sev more severe viral infections. In contrast, people who regularly exercise, they're physically active, they do yoga, they bike, they walk, and so forth, have improved immune responses, decreased incidence of various infections, whether it's you know upper respiratory tract infections, you know urinary tract infections, and much more. They have improved lung function. They have uh, even this should be really this should be top news. They have stronger and longer lasting antibody responses to various vaccinations. So the pro vaccine community should really care about exercise. Of course, they, they never even talk about it. Uh, they have, uh, you know, exercise can mitigate immunosenescence, which is the accumulation of these defective immune cells that, that release messengers to cause other immune cells to misbehave. Uh, and, and also exercise has anti-inflammatory capacity. So that leads to reduced severity of viral infections. So, so much stuff here that is not really being talked about, my friends. I don't know why, but I do want to thank you for tuning all the way in to the very end. Hopefully, you found this information at least somewhat helpful. I think practical, eating more real food, exercising more, focusing on your sleep, managing your stress. There's just like four simple things that we can all do. We can encourage our friends and family to do this. And again, if we're going to talk about moral responsibility and protecting others, we need to make sure our own bodies are healthy, Right. That our because you're we talk about like transmitting viruses, you have a microbiome cloud like around you. Like certain people that have dysbiosis, they smell bad. That that microbiome cloud can influence other people. And this is partly how, you know, just as a small, you know, a little thing a lot of people don't know about, like babies, for example, how their microbiome and their immune system is getting educated by being around family, just touching the skin, breastfeeding on the nipple, uh, and, and being passed around by different family members. That social interaction shapes the microbiome, which then shapes the immune system in newborn. So um, this is really important stuff, friends. So we got to spread this message if we really care about public health. So I'm grateful that you're tuning all the way into the end. Hopefully you found this helpful. Hit that like button if you did. Leave a comment below. I'd like to read your comments and know uh, how we can help create content that you're interested in. So we will catch you in a future video down the road. Have an awesome rest of your day. Bye now.